sure. Okay. So for those of you on, on the uh, Zoom webinar, I will be, we're going to be sending you a SurveyMonkey um, evaluation if you can complete that. It'll go out this afternoon or tomorrow morning. Okay, Dr. McLean, it's all yours. Okay. I didn't know I was going to get a grade on this project, but that's okay. Mm -hmm. it's, it started off as a pretty um, um, informal thing, but I think this, um, this whole presentation will benefit from being a little bit more formal. And, um, and that will this be available for people to go back and review um, as a, a saved webinar? Yes, we're going to, once, uh, since we're recording it, I'm going to have Christy put that on the website and the link will be on there. Good. I think that would be great. And uh, it might even be good to share with colleagues that weren't able to join us today. So um, as I think most of you know, I'm uh, one of the geneticists here at the Children's Hospital and um, am available by email and by uh, cell phone. I, I tend not to answer my cell phone just because I get so many calls while I'm seeing patients, but please leave a message um, if something comes up. Um, the um, the idea for this, let me see how I can advance this. The idea for this is to support general pediatricians to begin genetic testing of children with developmental delay. So that's sort of the narrow focus, although you'll see how this um, can expand itself. Uh, the Texas Health Institute through the uh, Mountain States Regional Genetics Network is um, supporting this and fostering the, the whole project, which we're very excited about. And as I go through this, if there are questions that come up and you want to interrupt me, that, that would be just fine. Um, please don't hesitate. So I have nothing to disclose. I've been on this road before too. There really is nothing for the next 22 miles. Um, um, so the idea for this project um, came up uh, because the chromosome microarray is, which we abbreviate CMA, is a, a really a workhorse for evaluating uh, children with unexplained developmental delay, intellectual disability, autism, uh, and multiple congenital anomalies. Um, but Having a correct diagnosis is really important, not just to admire, but to, because we can identify treatments and sort of what we can do to manage these children better. Plus it gives us uh, this brilliant uh, possibility to look into the future to know what's out there. Um, and then we can provide counseling about recurrence risk and sort things out. So it has multiple useful areas of usefulness. Um, and the earlier we can come up with a diagnosis, the better we can do in terms of providing these benefits and ultimately to have healthier children. Um, but there's the rub because um, it's hard to get this done quickly, especially when there's only two geneticists um, in San Antonio. Uh, so we have an opportunity to not just limit chromosome microarray testing to geneticists, but to um, take that out into the primary care community. So we have less of a problem getting benefits to these children. You know, back in the day when chromosome testing was the only genetic test we had, I think pediatricians were uh, more likely to, to use that just because that was something you were familiar with. The chromosome microarray is a little bit more daunting. Um, we recognize that primary care is the, the logical gateway to genetic services. Uh, pediatricians diagnose neurodevelopmental disorders and birth defects, and uh, the medical home is the, the customer for us. It's who we serve uh, uh, as a genetic um, center here. Pediatricians, I think, um, um, in a uh, very understandable way, see this kind of test as having lots of barriers because it's hard to understand exactly what it is. It seems to technologically a little bit different. And then 
getting the test done can be very daunting because insurance companies have this idea that they need to uh, uh, approve this. Uh, and the second part, how to get the test done in terms of the uh, logistics is going to be um, the focus of the second element in this webinar series that um, Rebecca Littlejohn, uh, one of our genetic counselors, is going to do uh, coming up in December. So chromosome analysis was the original uh, genomic test uh, back in the early 60s, where you visually can see all the chromosomes. They come in pairs. We have bands. We have centromeres. And we can see when something is different, uh, if it's big enough. So we can see trisomy 21. We can see Cree Duchat syndrome. It's pretty straightforward. The microarray uses a different sort of um, diagnostic platform where you basically compare your patient's DNA or your patient's genome to a standard uh, quote-unquote normal genome to see if there are differences. And if there are extra sections of the genome, that shows up as these little, um, these little blips. Um, I don't know if you can see the cursor, but um, my arrow is pointing at these little areas which are elevated over the, looks the baseline, which probably represent um, uh, an unusual number of copies of that part of the genome. That's why we call them copy number variants when we see uh, variations on the chromosome microarray. Um, now, this is a busy slide, uh, but I put it on here intentionally because it's really full of information. And right at the bottom, you can see the reference to a JAMA article that came out relatively recently. This is a great article because it's only uh, one page. It's written by some really great folks. The reference to this is a little bit more uh, fleshed out later in the presentation. And um, it really walks you through everything you need to know about the chromosome microarray. So G-banded karyotyping shown here on the left of chromosome 22 shows the centromere and different bands. And uh, there is a limitation to how much you can find uh, if something is missing or is extra. When we have a child with an unexplained neurodevelopmental problem or birth defects and we do standard traditional chromosome testing, we will find an abnormality three to five percent of the time. And that's because the level of detection is five to ten megabases of DNA. Um, and if, if it's less than that, it could cause problems, but you would never see it on a chromosome analysis. Uh, the chromosome microarray, um, shown here in the middle section, is capable of finding areas that are much smaller, uh, up to um, um, or, or, or as small as 400 kilobases, and sometimes even smaller, uh, using a combination of small snippets of DNA called oligonucleotides, or even single nucleotide polymorphisms, or SNPs. Um, and here you can see that uh, the deletion on chromosome 22 is very apparent on the chromosome microarray where there's uh, less than the normal number of copies over here in the red little dots. And so that allows us to diagnose um, uh, velocardiofacial syndrome or to George syndrome when you have this deletion. So think of chromosome analysis um, as having a resolution of maybe 550, like the, the number of bands that you can see on a regular karyotype. And the chromosome microarray, depending on the platform you use, and most of the time we use the single nucleotide polymorphism and oligonucleotide combination, that has a resolution of uh, two and a half million um, sort of locations across the genome. And so it's much more powerful. Uh, a Tesla compared to a Model T, and it's more expensive, but um, comparatively for the for the um, bang for the buck, it's really worth it. Um, so to break it down a little bit differently, uh, chromosome analysis is old school, um, and you know it's pretty sharp and it has its moments. Um, the turnaround time for chromosomes is seven to fourteen days. Uh, it can find translocations of the chromosomes, which may or may not cause any problems whatsoever. It can identify mosaicism pretty well. Um, it can't find uniprimal disomy where a part of the genome is 
inherited from just one parent. Um, and it can't identify whether parents are related to each other by blood. Now the microarray is, I say it's more millennial and you know, it has its different way of dressing. Of course, I don't wear those skinny jeans, but don't hold that against me. Um, chromosome microarray now is considered the standard of care in terms of the first line genomic test. Um, the turnaround time is about the same, uh, maybe a little bit longer, depending on the lab you use. It is incapable of finding a translocation, which is why uh, we do not use this uh, as a first line choice to look at uh, Down syndrome because it can't identify a Robertsonian translocation. Um, it can identify certain levels of mosaicism and some types of unipermal disomy it can identify. Uh, it's actually pretty good at identifying whether parents are re related to each other by blood. Uh, and that can come up um, when you talk to parents about um, this test. So you've probably seen something like this before and rolled your eyes, uh, a chromosome microarray report. You think this is hieroglyphics, um, but let me break it down for you. Um, the um, meat of the chromosome microarray report is right here on this line here. And if you, um, if you teased it out, it would look like this. It starts ARR, meaning array. And then um, it often refers to which version of the genome is being used to um, um, compare your patient's um, uh, genome to. Uh, because at different eras, um, uh, in our history, we have different versions of the, the quote-unquote standard human genome. So HD19 is one of the more recent uh, versions. So for this report, um, the patient's um, genome was compared to uh, HD19, and it's chromosome 15, uh, Q for long arm, 11.2. One, one um, and then we have these fancy numbers in the parentheses, and that's actually the the nucleotide position where um, the minimal interval begins and where the minimal interval ends. So it goes from nucleotide um, 22,842,145 to 23,300,182, and it's, it's present here in three copies. That's the X3. Um, so there's where the chromosome 15 uh, the HD19 version, and there's the HD19. It's on the long arm of chromosome 15, and then a section was duplicated. So there, so there are three copies instead of two, um, and that's right there. Um, but the most important part of the chromosome microarray report is the interpretation. And you can see here that the laboratory director has um, decided to identify this as um, this did not and identify any changes that are associated with known microdeletion or microduplication syndromes. Um, and then the, uh, the gain has been observed in other probands, that means patients that come to see you and their normal parent. Therefore, this finding most likely represents a familial copy number variant, um, which means that it's um, probably not causing problems, although the clinical significance is unclear at the time. So let me go through this a little bit more. So the, uh, this recaps that the duplicated section begins at one position and ends at another. It, actually, if you do the math, this is 458,000 nucleotides in size uh, that are copy in a third in a third copy, 458 kilobases or 0.458 megabases, uh, which is what these little numbers are up here. And within this section are seven genes. And here are the genes right here. They call them RefSeq genes because these are definitely genes that have been well characterized and studied. Uh, so I translate RefSeq as meaning legitimate. These are real genes that have real meanings. But the fact that they're present in three copies we don't think causes, um, doesn't clearly cause any problems and very likely is benign. 
So the person that's doing this interpretation is a, a laboratory geneticist who has board certification in clinical cytogenetics and genomics. Um, and when they do this interpretation, they're basing it on a, re a review of the literature and their clinical judgment. Um, they do a much better job at sorting out the meaning of these variations if they know why they're doing the chromosome microarrays. Um, sometimes that information gets transmitted to them and sometimes not. And this is Art Baudet at um, uh, Baylor, and he's the one who signed off on this particular um, microarray report. If you see something and you just don't know what's going on, there are two lifelines uh, to call. One is the lab director directly and say, um, what does this mean? And the other one is to call us here in the genetics clinic and we can help you solve that question. So the interpretations that the laboratory will come up with um, would consist of one of five sort of bins or categories. Either it's nothing, it's completely benign. Uh, on the other hand, it might definitely mean something that is causing problems, which would be called pathogenic. And then you have these categories in the middle. Uh, right in the middle is the variant of uncertain significance, something that is, we, we just don't know what, it. it's like a word that's misspelled and you aren't quite sure whether it's a misspelling or whether it's just a word that you don't recognize. And so you have to wonder, what, what does it mean? It's just not clear. Sometimes we can shade that sort of designation into, it looks, uh, the characteristics are likely benign, but we're not 100% sure it's benign, or it looks like it might be causing a problem, but we're not 100% sure. Sometimes, uh, but not always, the solution is to test the parents to see if they have the same thing. And the lab report usually will recommend that you test parents if that's something that could be helpful. Um, now, depending on the laboratory, they may or may not charge for testing parents, and it all depends on the lab that you pick. So here's the plan. Being formal military, I like the military planning posture up there. So first, um, if this all works out, the pediatrician gets the chromosome microarray done. And the way that happens is uh, you first identify the patients who should get tested because you know them. Uh, they have significant developmental delays or birth defects, uh, autism. Uh, if it's a boy, don't forget to get the fragile X test. That's standard of care. We would hate to uh, miss that opportunity. Um, and that should be not just sequencing the fragile X gene, that's not really very helpful, but doing the trinucleotide repeat analysis of the FMR1 gene. Question? No? So you explain the test to the family, and I know this is where things can get dicey because you say, I have a fancy test, and the parents say, and what is it? And you say, that's a good question. <laughs> um, it's complicated. Um, but I think you'll be able to do that after this. Uh, providing a handout to the family can be very helpful. Uh, we have that. You write an order. Uh, you get the insurance preauthorization, which is going to be the topic of the next uh, session that we do on this uh, CMA. Uh, you send the patient to the lab uh, with the correct paperwork. Uh, you make sure the lab is doing a good job and make sure they draw the right tube and um, um, scold them if they don't do it correctly, uh, like you do for any other lab, uh, the same as you would do with the CBC. And then you wait for the results. At the same time that you send the CMA, the idea is to send the patient to genetics. You're just help. You're not flying solo on this. Uh, at the same time, you're, you're just getting things started. Um, so you put the referral in. I know that we often have a long wait list. We're doing our best to go faster. And I think this whole process of getting the chromosome microarray done um, at the beginning of the referral can really help that. Um, and then when you get the results, you send those to us so that we have them in time to talk about them to the patients. Okay, so the pediatrician gets the results. 
and it's a variant of uncertain significance. Rats, that's just what I was not hoping for. Um, and say the lab suggests testing parents, and you go, oh, not what I was hoping for. Okay, but you can do that. Um, and you can send, uh, you can check with us to make sure you're getting it done properly, but all this is, um, is quite feasible. Um, so to help, um, you can call me, but it's better to call one of our board certified genetic counselors, such as Rebecca Littlejohn, there's her number, and Kimberly Nugent, and there's her number. They're sitting right next to me right now. Um, they answer their phone all day long, and I turn my, uh, I turn my phone off. But I take, I take messages. So the geneticist or genetic counselor, uh, or both of us together as a team, we get the handoff uh, with the chromosome microarray results. And if we find something, if it shows us a diagnosis, we basically put that to work. We explain what the diagnosis is to the family. We may or may not test other family members. Um, and then we develop a management plan based on the evidence that comes along for the ride with the definitive diagnosis. And we communicate that to the parents and to the other subspecialists, but mostly we communicate it to the pediatrician um, because that's where all the action is. Uh, we tell the parents about their recurrence risk. Um, if they're planning more children, we'll put them in touch with uh, prenatal um, genetics and our MFM uh, colleagues. Uh, we will follow the patient over the long term to help them understand it and to provide them with guidance um, over the, really over their lifetime. I mean, we even see adults. Um, the medical home, center of the universe. We got that. Now, what if the chromosome microarray shows nothing? It's completely normal. Uh, well, that information is still useful uh, because it excludes a whole host of things. Uh, we explain that to the family. And then we go on, likely we'll recommend other tests, um, such as uh, the panels of tests, maybe single genes, maybe the exome. Um, and we'll take care of all that part for the time being. Um, even if we don't have um, a definitive diagnosis, we can help with some ideas for management, sort of empirically based, and then communicate that to the family and to the pediatrician. And then we make our best guess about the possible recurrence risk and talk to parents about that. And again, we will continue to follow the patient over the long term and we'll continue to seek a definitive etiologic diagnosis. And again, the medical home continues uh, from our point of view to remain in the center of the healthcare universe. So Explaining chromosomes and a chromosome microarray to patients is, um, it's a big job. It's hard. Uh, a lot of our families aren't really quite sure that we're made up of cells. And so you have to go back to really basic biology. Uh, in terms of uh, resources that you can provide to, to families to um, and give them information about what chromosomes are and what a chromosome microarray is, there's this website uh, at Chromosome Disorder Outreach. Um, here's the link to an introduction to chromosomes, which is pretty good. Um, it's a little bit long. Um, and then here's a handout, and I have a, a link to um, a document that I have on my Google Drive here uh, that uh, is a one-pager that explains chromosome microarray testing in pretty simple language. And this is just an excerpt. Um, that I have in the box down here. So, so this is the article from uh, JAMA that recently was published uh, by Krista Martin and David Ledbetter. They were both up at Geisinger, which is very genomically organized um, 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 healthcare system uh, in Pennsylvania in the Northeast. Uh, and this is, I think, a really excellent article. Plus, if you go on to this, um, uh, um, uh, you access this article um, by computer, you can get um, an audio version, and it also has a CME 
um, section so you can get CME on this. So that's pretty much the presentation. Uh, we think you can do it. I'm not sure if you can ride without hands, but I, we think you can do this. And I'd be happy to take um, questions and comments um, from anybody that's interested. Scott, could I make a comment? This is Celia. Yes. Yeah, and my, my only comment besides thank you, uh, I think this is the most lucid explanation I've ever seen, um, is that there are many resources for pediatricians that Mountain States has uh, developed and they are on the website. <clears throat> soon, I hope, will be your CMA document in both English and Spanish. Um, as soon as um, we get the final word from Elizabeth that she's okay with us translating it and putting it on the website. But there are many other documents that have been developed. One explaining variants of uncertain significance for the family, so that's in English and Spanish. There's a basic genetics document in English and Spanish. Um, there's um, consent issues for genetic testing meant for the pediatrician. Um, so there's a, there's a lot of stuff on there. And if you just uh, Google Mountain States Regional Genetics Network, it'll take you right to our website and you can find a lot of stuff. Now, if you want to read the, art, the specific articles that Scott has referenced, um, you need to go to them. Uh, those are not... Um, in the same place on our website. So I'm highly recommending that you follow Scott's uh, suggestions and read in whatever depth you want. But in terms of uh, documents for families and for, for pediatricians, uh, they are on the website now. The other one I forgot to mention is that families have expressed concern about privacy. And there's a document on the website on the federal laws protecting the privacy of genetic information and the state laws protecting the privacy of genetic information so that you'll be able to tell them what laws are out there to make sure that this information stays where it needs to stay, which is with the family, the primary care physician and the geneticist. This is Courtney Smith. Um, will Dr. McLean's presentation be available um, to actual PowerPoint with those links um, on the previous slide? Will this be available to us afterwards? Dr. McLean, do you want to add this to the uh, website? We can put this as a PDF along with the recording, if you agree. Well, I mean, I think it'll be, that would be fine. Um, but I, and that, I thought we thought this was going to be um, available somehow because we were recording it, so. Yes, so this is going to be recording, uh, rec it is being recorded, so the PowerPoints will be on the website with the link to the recorded webinar. Great. Sure. And I have one more question. Uh, Joe Ferreris is in here with me, even though he's not signed on. Um, so if y'all are speaking, um, I did have one more question. So pre-counseling, um, the counseling that we would do with families and the disclosures before we actually send the CMA or genetic testing, is that going to be covered in Rebecca's webinar um, in December? Or are there any additional thoughts you have on that right now? Um, I think that um, a lot of um, what you need to say to parents um, at the outset but prior to um, doing the test is pretty much explaining um, what you have observed in terms of there being something concerning about the developmental situation and um, and the usual sorts of things you would say, we're, we need to look into the reason for this because, and then sort of explain the logic behind diagnosis in the first place, that it's, it's great to recognize that there is a delay but if we understand the origin of the delay, sometimes we can have better tools to do something creative and effective about that. And then explain a little bit more about the, um, uh, the biology. Um, and of course you talk about biology to parents all the time. You explain what a bacteria is and versus a virus. So um, I think they, what I would recommend you do would, um, would be to read 
the the handouts uh, uh, that I've sort of provided the link for. Let me go back to this one. Um, yeah, so this one right here. At this link right here, um, if you read this handout, um, it kind of is a, um, it gives you talking points and language that I think it would be very accessible to your patients. And I think, uh, for instance, um, you could paraphrase this part here, why do this test? I, I want to get this new test called a chromosome microarray for a couple of reasons for Johnny, because I don't know why he has a ventricular septal defect and and eight fingers. And his, he's slow in his development, and I don't know why that is. And I want to have a better explanation, because if I do, then I can take better care of him. And then I can also, uh, when I refer you to the genetics folks, they might be able to tell you whether this could happen to the triplets that you're about to deliver. <laughs> um, and I, I think um, I like the explanation that this is a link to because it's not written in any technical language. It's, it's intentionally written at like a sixth to eighth grade level, uh, which I think is accessible even for our um, uh, PhD parents because the technical language of medicine is very off-putting for a lot of folks. That sounds great, Dr. McLean. It's Joe Ferreris here. The bigger issue that I've run into is I've started to share some information, what I call pre-testing counseling. There's an article uh, on the National Library of Medicine written by uh, Karen Heller, which talks about genetic counseling, DNA testing for the patient, and it gets into some of the things that they feel are sort of best practice for things to discuss with the patient slash family before testing is done. And it's sort of more generic rather than we find this for your kid and so we can do further evaluation. But it's sort of the, you know, what do you do with testing? What do you do with the results? How can that impact the family? And, and some of the stuff that Dr. K was talking about. So I've been sharing some of that with some of my patients. And I'll be honest with you, when they read that, most of them don't want to do a lot of testing because they really sort of feel like it's a Pandora's box that has a sort of a unending level of risk to their um, medical information, privacy, et cetera. Well, I think, you know, that's fair. I mean, we, uh, with genetic testing, we have always um, been of the mind that it is a choice um, and that uh, the choice pro and con should be respected and supported. Um, there are pros and cons to anything. In fact, uh, on this link to um, um, information about the chromosome microarray testing, there is a little, I have a little black box at the end, which talks about the two things that I mentioned before. One is that um, if parents are related by blood, if they are cousins or if they are even more closely related, this test will find it. Uh, the chromosome microarray is quite good at doing that, and um, I think that is um, a very useful disclosure. Um, um, so you may uh, explain that to a family, and then uh, mom may come for, and, and it, every once in a while you find out that it, it will help. Um, if, if you go down the pathway of genetic testing, you could find out somehow that the father on the birth certificate's not the actual father, if there's some polymorphism that um, is there, but, so. Um, there is, this is Cecilia again, um, in response to questions from Joe earlier in this process, we did also develop an elements of consent for genetic testing document, and that's on the website as well. And basically it's taken from the Texas Medical Association uh, recommendations on how to get consent, but then each um, the, the special issues related to genetic testing consent are noted in this particular document, and that's meant for, for the primary care nutrition. So I think maybe you know, for those of you who are starting to have these conversations with your patients, that might be useful, not just about consent, but about the things that Joe is mentioning that people want to hear about, and um, maybe a visit or two before they agree to testing or to allow them to disagree. You know, people, as, as Scott said, they don't have to have this done. 
this is a choice. There is advantages and disadvantages, and, and those are also spelled out in the document on consent. This is Dr. DeLeon. Um, I had actually reached out to Rebecca a couple of weeks ago regarding a patient who I thought was perfect to get this done, and I, the roadblocks to getting this ordered um, were quite big. So I know we're going to be touching on that soon. Um, but getting, finding out which lab to send them to. In fact, she, she helped me because something we noticed on Athena, um, I couldn't even order the Fragile X the way my computer was set up. So we had to change some settings there, which I, I think she'll probably go over. Um, but ordering it was, was a hurdle. Um, finding the lab where to send them to, um, the prior authorization, all of that. These are, these are huge hurdles for us that we really need to. Uh, yeah, I'm, and I'm sorry about that. It's, it's true, but I think we, uh, we can put things into place to break that down. We can have um, go-to labs and go-to processes so that you don't have to reinvent the wheel every time. Um, um, of course, I say that with a full knowledge that um, um, in our clinic, half the time I just say, Rebecca, get this done, and then magically it happens. Right. <laughs> or Kimberly, right. get this done. Um, I, you can't if, underestimate. If you could have a Rebecca or Kimberly, that'd be great. <laughs> um, We're going to bottle them and then um, sell them. <laughs> that, that's a good idea. So um, one of the things that we had hoped to generate out of this whole project at Mountain States, and again, this is Celia again, was a manual. And we've held off on that. Uh, we've collected a lot of information that has been kindly provided by the counselors, Rebecca and Kimberly, and by Scott and Elizabeth, um, that the letters of support and so on. But we're not, we, I want to go through that second webinar, let you, let you hear from the counselors, what are the best ways to do this in San Antonio. And then if it comes out of that, that there are other materials that we haven't developed yet and that aren't clear from these two webinars, then we'll make that happen. Mm -hmm. So that, that's, I think that one thing we've learned is that every place is unique. You have a unique population. You have special, particular needs for laboratories that your system wants to work with, um, that your geneticists like. So we're going to do this at each setting because otherwise it won't be useful to you and it won't help things for the patients. So be a little bit patient with us. And after the second webinar, which I think is now set for December 4th, then we'll have this conversation about, okay, now you, know, you see what you've got. You've looked at the website, you've looked at the articles, you've heard this, these two webinars, what are you missing? And what can we create that will make this easier for you? I wanted to point out that I selected this final slide, you can do it, of um, um, uh, someone riding a bike. I think this is actually an actor portraying um, Einstein here. <laughs> um, riding a bike and very intentionally because uh, I, I see this whole process of getting chromosome microarray testing done, much like learning to ride a bike, where the first time you, you can understand the principles and um, be very expert at oh, following the Tour de France and, and Lance Armstrong and everybody, but unless you actually get on the bike and try to ride it, you're not going to be very good. But after you get the hang of it, it's much easier. It's, it's kind of like also like doing um, LP, uh, doing a spinal tap. Uh, the first few times you do it, you probably can remember it was very um, stressful, <laughs> uh, pretty hard and getting everything together and the right tubes. And I don't know if, oh, I forgot to put the label on. Oh, I spilled it. Oh, I got a bloody tap. And now, you know, for experienced pediatricians, an LP is like, okay, let's do this. You know, you know how to do it. You know, it can be tricky. Um, um, there are sometimes bumps in the road, but you know, you can get it done. And I think with micro race, once you sort of get on the bike and ride it a little bit, it's, going to be much easier. Um, your staff will sort of have it down. You'll know what to do. Um, 
uh, in terms of the details to make it go smoothly. Uh, and by the same token, in you, the practice and talking to your patients about it um, from a position of authority and uh, of understanding it becomes much easier the more you practice. Of course, I wish you could get reimbursed for it and equivalent, but um, I can only do so much. <laughs> Um, Scott, this is uh, Becky Houston. Thanks for a great overview. I did want to just ask, um, I, and I know we've got the algorithms from Celia K as far as when to get the CMA, but can you just touch briefly on those times where you're still get, ordering the Model T karyotype? Yes, I certainly can do that. Um, I order the karyotype when I have a uh, a genetic condition that um, I clinically have a very high suspicion for. For instance, uh, a newborn with Down syndrome, I will order the Model T. Um, I could diagnose trisomy 21 with a chromosome microarray, but the chromosome microarray would fail to give me some very important information, which is mostly whether or not that child has a Robertsonian translocation. I want to know that if it's a 1421 translocation because I need that to give accurate recurrence risk counseling, uh, not for the diagnosis necessarily of, of Down syndrome, uh, but that's very important. Um, uh, by the same token, if I see a, a short girl who is not having periods and she's 14 years old, um, I think um, a karyotype, uh, the Model T version is very helpful because I need to know um, if this is um, a garden variety Turner syndrome or whether it's isodicentric XP uh, or, you know, there are a lot of variations of that, which I can't pick up with um, um, a chromosome microarray, but the straightforward orientation of the different chromosomes is more accurate with um, a karyotype. Um, the other time that I order the carry type sometimes is um, when I know that there is a um, uh, a balanced translocation in a parent, and I'm looking for an unbalanced translocation in the the child. Um, sometimes that will will work. Um, yeah, and those are I think some of the major indications, or let's say it's trisomy 13, I think uh, clinically I, I would order chromosomes. Um, yeah. It's very quiet out there. Are, do, are there any other questions for Scott or any other comments? Uh, directed at any of the rest of us from Mountain States? Well, hearing none, I know Scott is not going away and still exists on the virtual uh, world, and so do I. So, And uh, if you have logistical questions about how to find the information that we've talked about today, and that Laura is the person, but you can certainly email me at any time. Um, and ask questions about any of this, and I'll direct you to the person who knows the answer best, which is usually not me, but I can usually find that person. And I really want to thank Scott for a great explanation. Great, thank you so much. Also, this is Annette. Um, for those of you on the call, I will be sending you a link for a survey of the, to, um, with the evaluation so if you can go ahead and um, participate on that evaluation survey monkey link that I send you out. As you know, this is a HRSA funded program and they like to see what we are doing and your feedback is important. Fill out that evaluation, we appreciate it. And the next uh, second webinar will be December the 4th at the same time. Okay, thanks everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Thank you guys very much. Okay. Bye. Bye-bye.
Thank you, Celia. Thank you so much, Scott. And, and thanks in advance for what the ladies will be doing. Um, I guess it's next week. Yeah, they have to do all the hard work. Yeah, I know. I know. And, you know, those questions are valid. And whatever we need to create, we will make every effort to create uh, if, if there are gaps that the pediatricians tell us about. Was this what you had envisioned this Absolutely. presentation to be like? Absolutely. This was perfect. For okay. me, it good. was five stars. It was, it was great. Thank you. All right. Good. Thanks. Okay. okay. All right. You take care. Bye-bye. Bye. I'm going to turn off the... Yeah. You can leave the meeting. All right. <laughs> all right. I'm the host, so it's all going to go away. Okay. Bye. Bye-bye. Okay.